Is this still recording? It's on? Yeah. You're just going to edit all this bullshit? It's a waste of time, though, isn't it? Having to listen you to some... say something amazing. Say so- I might say something amazing. I, I, I always say something oh, amazing. I've just turned on the recorder in front of my dad at his house in Northern California. This is our first recording session, and he's a little uncomfortable being recorded, and for good reason. Because while my dad was an amazing father who made sure I grew up with a storybook childhood, this is the first time he is telling me about his double life. Because for 20 plus years, from the late 60s to the late 1980s, my dad was a pot smuggler of considerable proportions. Do you want to just tell us about what the bond of outlaws is? To not talk about anything ever? You mean, is that what you're speaking of? That it's, that's what we're not supposed to do, is talk about it? So getting me and a whole bunch of my crazy friends to be talking about stuff is a, a little fucking crazy. For the past year, I've been interviewing my parents and all these people in my life who I've learned were part of the smuggling network. And hearing these stories has truly changed my life. I'm Rainbow Valentine, and this is Disorganized Crime, Smuggler's Daughter. Rolling a doobie, young, free, and groovy, make it up as we roll along. Rolling along, far out the country road. So here's what I tell people about this podcast. Like most kids in the 1980s, I was obsessed with Indiana Jones movies. I would dig for treasure in my backyard all the time. (laughs) Well, actually, during one of my digging bouts in the mid-80s when I was about eight or nine, there was, in fact, half a million dollars buried in my backyard. Well, it wasn't like you'd (laughs) find it. It, You would have discovered a big steel box. Which would have appeared to be a pirate treasure chest. Which <laughs> would have been a treasure chest. It was like it was this treasure big, box. It was big. So this is my dad. He's just finished telling me about one of his biggest smuggles. Helping some of his old smuggling pals distribute 60,000 pounds of Lebanese hash. He ended up smuggling 4,000 pounds. Oh, you know, just 4,000 pounds of hash. No big deal. Or the equivalent of $250,000. Which, at the time was over $1.3 million in today's money. And my dad needed to keep that money safe until the pals who initially smuggled the hash into the country from Lebanon could come and collect. But my dad had a problem. He didn't know where to put that much cash in my snug childhood home. So he decided to bury the money in the yard. I, I got a big steel box. And I put it all in this steel box, and then I went out to our gardens, uh, which were all, at that time, blackberry bushes. The whole acreage was all blackberries, so you couldn't really see much of anything. And I went from this bush to this bush to whatever and found a spot to bury it, and I buried the shit. And finally, uh, a long time later, it could be six months, that I get a call saying, yo, bro, we want to come over, we want to, we're going to come out next week and pick it up. Cool, no problem. Okay, so I had to go out there and find it. However, by the time that had happened, we had already worked on our land and got rid of all of the blackberries. And, I mean, I, I had hired these two uh, guys to not only dig up, uh, get rid of the blackberries, but to dig up the roots and sift them, sift through them with it so we wouldn't have, so it would become gardens. All my idiot landmarks were destroyed. And it had been so long since I put the fucking thing in the ground, I, I couldn't initially find it. And I started to freak out, and then I freaked out thinking, oh, fuck, did these guys do in the garden find it and just take it? Oh, my God. The yard of my childhood home was three-fourths of an acre on a steep hill. It's huge, precarious, and it always took a ton of work. 
My mom gardened constantly, planting massive bamboo groves with huge shovels, not dinky hand spades. I was probably there for the frantic search, but I blocked it out because nothing stresses me out like my dad's stress, which is huge, theatrical, and like a frazzled, angry cabbie in Manhattan traffic. Super New York-y. I'm sure my parents' frantic search was full of blood, sweat, and tears. Where the fuck is it? Oh, Christ. Spoiler, he finds it, buried now near the pear tree. But in this moment, my dad learns an important smuggling lesson. If you're going to bury treasure in the backyard, remember where the fuck you put it. Did you ever bury stuff in the yard again? No. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, hi, I'm Rainbow Valentine. So Rainbow Valentine is not my real name, although I did start calling myself Rainbow Valentine when I was five because I thought that rainbows and valentines were the two most beautiful things in the world, so together it would be the most beautiful thing in the universe. So I've spent the last year on a midlife reckoning, as my BFF says, opening Pandora's box and learning about what my parents and most of the adults in my childhood were up to while I endeavored to get cast as Annie or Dorothy. Now, that never happened, but I have learned all about the grown-ups in my life smuggling thousands of pounds of pot, whilst I willingly humiliated myself by belting out somewhere over the rainbow at the Senior Citizen Center. I'm using this alias of Rainbow Valentine because most of the people I'm talking to, former smugglers that is, are not comfortable having their names revealed. My parents have finally settled on Walter and Taffy Lemur. We cycled through Kimmy, Whitefish, and various other ridiculous names. To be clear, I've known my dad was a pot smuggler since I was 14. I remember my older sister, Vertica, who was in college at the time, sat me down one summer day and in a hushed voice told me the family secret, that our dad was a big-time pot smuggler in California. Then she said to never tell anyone that I knew this information, and definitely don't mention it to our parents. Well, being a bit of a loudmouth, I did mention it a few times, and in return received a deadly serious warning to never speak of this to anyone from my dad. Before this year, the last time I even tried to bring up the whole being a smuggler for 22 years thing was when I came home from college in the mid-1990s, more than five years after my dad was out of the smuggling business. My dad was driving me home from the airport, and I remember him slamming on the brakes. And he said, well, I'll just let him tell you what he told me. I remember very much stopping the car and saying to you, it is critical that you never speak of this to anyone, ever, because more than anything, loose lips sink ships. Ah, but times they are a-changing. All over California, you'll see billboards advertising pot delivery and dispensaries. There are apps where you can get pot legally dropped off right at your doorstep. Also, statutes of limitations on my dad's smuggling days have long run out. And as they age, my dad and mom are feeling a little more comfortable with the idea of sharing their secret stories. Good morning, Vietnam. Is mom there too? Hi. Okay. Hi. She is. I called my parents on their anniversary. They've been together since 1970, but only married in 2002. They wanted to make sure they really liked each other. And I asked them to introduce themselves and their aliases, Taffy and Walter Lemur. Hi, this is Taffy Lemur and my husband, Walter Lemur. Walter and I are in our 70s, and I'm in my late 70s. And we came from the 50s and the 60s and stepped into the revolution of the hippie revolution when the 60s happened. And then we never left. And can you tell us a little bit about your husband, Walter Lemur, my dad? He's a connoisseur of uh, art and decorations and food, and um, he likes to talk. He's a schmoozer. He's from New York. And Dad, can you introduce your wife? Hi there. Walter here. I uh, came out from the East Coast in 1970 from New York. I landed on the porch of two of the Grateful Dead's roadies, And within a couple of months, uh, being in the center of that scene, I was introduced through them to your lovely 
mother with whom I've been for 49 years, the great and famous uh, Kathy Lemer. With my eccentric, bohemian, artsy, intellectual parents at the helm, I had an idyllic childhood. When I was a toddler, our family, me, my mom, my dad, and my six-year-old sister, Vertica, moved just north of the Golden Gate Bridge in Sausalito to Mill Valley, a redwood bee-treed valley nestled below Mount Tamalpais. Named for its 1800 sawmill, which still stands in Old Mill Park, it was where families from all over the Bay Area summered in the 1800s. After the Golden Gate Bridge was constructed in 1937, real estate boomed in Mill Valley, and it hasn't stopped since. In the 1970s, Mill Valley became an area associated with great wealth, with so many people making their millions in San Francisco and moving north to raise kids. 1970s Mill Valley had a quiet, low-key, homespun, hippie wealth vibe. It was charming, rural, a funky town full of small businesses and young counterculture families, progressive intellectuals, rock stars, nature lovers, and old California gold rush moneyed families. I remember singing this song about Mill Valley as a kid. It's by Rita Abrams, a Mill Valley resident, and it perfectly illustrates the feel-good hippie vibe of my childhood in Northern California. Where people aren't afraid to smile And stop and talk with you a while And you can be as friendly as you want to be Mill Valley talking about I love those flutes. It's joyful nostalgia. It just feels good. It just feels right. Anyway, among the rolling landscapes and redwoods was my house, tucked among the trees, blackberry bushes, and roses that adorned our driveway, which to me as a kid seemed like the longest dirt driveway in the world. Our family was close, always together, cooking and eating, hanging out in the main part of the house, which was an open kitchen, dining room, living room with giant windows and sliding glass doors to the deck, koi pond, and massive gardens full of fruit trees, play structures, the trampoline, and more. (laughs) So much more I've since learned. Our house was usually full of laughter, delicious food, original art, and it was a center of social activity. My parents' friends constantly dropped by and stayed for dinner, and every weekend my friends visited for slumber parties, spending multiple nights. My friends and I would concoct stories that we would theatrically record into my cassette player, with me always taking center stage. Dracula is coming for lunch. I shall cook my specialty, brain a la noodle. What shall you cook? I shall cook <laughs> my specialty, fried a la eyeball. Yummy, yum. It's set so delicious. Every night, my parents would read to me in my treehouse loft bed, wallpapered with Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I went to an artsy, holistic, progressive school where each day started with an hour of music. When I was eight, my sister 13 in the early 80s, our little brother was born, and I became the middle child. My memories of childhood are joyful, full of abundance, both the material, like playing Legos at our Tahoe house, and the immaterial, like community, magical, spiritual, connected to the earthedness, friends, family, and a lot of absurdities. When I look back now, I feel ridiculous for not realizing that something was going on behind the scenes in our family home. Our house was pretty different from TV houses like the Brady Bunch, my fave show. For instance, we had a second parking lot on the property for all the extra oversized vehicles my family owned. The Brady Bunch only had that one wood-paneled station wagon. Our carport had a clutch of outdoor storage closets packed with camping gear, ski gear, and dozens of hardback 70s Samsonite Burt Santa suitcases with combo locks. Okay, sure, we were a family of five, but we never seemed to use the suitcases. They were foamy inside and large enough for me to fit in, and I loved playing with them, pretending I was a stowaway or a hidden refugee, climbing inside and shutting the lid. Now, I get it. Ah, these amazing large suitcases were for transporting weed. I also have fond memories 